Hey there, you may or may not know me if you've been following this channel, but I'm Steve Borse. I decided to give you guys a little break today. I'm not going to have a webcam so you can see my face during the COVID outbreak. I'm just going to do this with audio and video. I know you're disappointed, but uh, you'll survive. Anyways, this is who I am. You can read over this if you're excited about it, but I'm really excited to bring you this lecture. It's based on my new course on Udemy. So make sure to check that out. If you want the lowest price coupon, I think it'll be like 10 bucks for you. Just send me an email if that link I provide on this YouTube video is not available. But this course covers connecting the ESP8266 or the ESP32 device to AWS and then doing all kinds of Lambda, API Gateway, DynamoDB, S3 visualizations with the web host, all kinds of exciting IoT stuff, which is what I focus on specifically. And for this video, it's going to be a four-part series. I'm going to be doing the ESP8266 or the ESP32. I have sketches for both, depending on which one you want to do. Connecting to API Gateway via REST, to your Lambda function, storing data in S3, and then finally we're going to visualize that data in a static web host using either high charts or chart.js. I'll decide a little bit later, and you can use whatever charting program you like, but I'll provide you all the coding material you're going to need, so you don't have to have any of your own code, just a free tier AWS account or your own AWS paid account. And if you have a paid account, this will probably cost you about five cents. I mean, these are all super cheap services for prototyping. Now, a good question to be asking right now is, why are you sending IoT data via a REST API to API Gateway rather than sending MQTT to AWS IoT Core? Well, throughout the course and 95% of the time, that's normally what I'm going to do is use MQTT and send it to AWS IoT Gateway. But I thought this would be more unique as far as a tutorial and walkthrough to show you indeed, even with the less powerful ESP8266 along with the more powerful ESP32, we can send data directly to API Gateway and avoid the AWS IoT broker if we want to for whatever reason. And there's reasons you may want to. For instance, if you have an embedded device that's constrained to only HTTP REST, or if you already have code designed in REST and you don't want to rewrite it, there may be various reasons you may want to send it to API Gateway directly rather than through the AWS IoT Core Broker. But this will be something unique you can kind of do because there's not a lot of information out there on doing it this way. And here's our agenda. So for this video, we're simply going to set up a private S3 bucket. We'll make it public later when we need to and design a Lambda function to send the test IoT payload to that bucket. Then you'll see what we're doing for video two, video three, and video four. And I'll post a written walkthrough for the first three videos. I don't want to do video four because that's going to be too advanced at that point and drawn out for most people. But if you do the walkthrough written and cross-reference it with this YouTube video, you can go ahead and use video four to kind of as a stretch lab for your IoT endeavors. So with that said, let me talk a little bit more specifically about what we're going to be doing. It's useful if we have sensors out in the field to bring IoT into our cloud to analyze the results, whether we want to do machine learning, AI, or do basic visualizations, business logic, whatever we want to do. So in this example, it's going to be kind of a basic walkthrough of our device, our ESP8266 or ESP32 is going to send off fake data, although you're welcome to put in any sensors you want. Peripheral libraries are very trivial in the Arduino IDE. And then we're going to send that via a public facing API through API Gateway. We're going to make an API key for our publicly facing URL. So we're not just letting anybody connect. And then that's going to connect to our Lambda function, which is going to push that data on with a little bit of enrichment and filtering onto our S3 static data bucket. And then in our S3 web host, we're going to ingest the data from that IoT data in that S3 data bucket and visualize our results. So that's kind of a walkthrough of what we're going to be doing. So having said that, let's go ahead and set up our S3 bucket, set up our Lambda, connect the two, and send the test payload so we make sure we're working. And then we'll move on from this point. Okay, so here we are in our AWS Management Console. Now, I'm not going to be using the serverless model, the SLS from the command prompt. You know, a lot of people teach that way, but I think for learning heuristics, it's just better to go through the console. If you understand the console, you can always move to the serverless framework or Chalice or whatever kind of frameworks you want to do. 
So that's the learning path that I'm going to teach. And here I'm in Ohio. You can be in any region you want. I think I'm just going to keep this in, why don't we do Northern California? That might make it more exciting. I'm just trying to pick a region where I don't have a lot of clutter. That's normally how I do it. Of course, some regions have more stuff available than other regions. Usually North Virginia is the safest region U.S. East wants because it's kind of the prototyping region. But let's go ahead right now in whatever region you're in, just keep these services consistent between each region. So let's go ahead now and go to S3. And this is going to be the easiest step. I'm just going to create an S3 bucket. So go ahead and create a bucket. Now, I kind of come up with a globally unique name, and the reason AWS requires a globally unique name is they're kind enough to give your buckets all their own static IP, their own unique URL. So to do that, of course, you need a globally unique name because there's only going to be one static IP or globally unique URL per address. So we'll call this one test bucket, and I'll say 78B. And that should be pretty well a globally unique name, I'm going to assume. I'm not going to set up any options, so no configuration tags or anything like that. And I'll keep this bucket as private. So go ahead and create this. And indeed, I was successful with the globally unique name. I'll go ahead and refresh this by date. So I know the last date that I created this bucket will always be my most recent bucket. I'm going to go and open this, and I'll go ahead and create a new folder. So we'll call this folder test folder. This one does not have to be globally unique, and I'm not going to have any kind of encryption in this folder. All right, great. So we have this new bucket and new test folder, and there's going to be nothing in this test folder. All right, we're good to go with our S3 bucket, and now we'll go ahead with the more complicated step and create our Lambda, and I'm going to want to keep this in the same region, so I'm just going to duplicate this tab. Go over here and come back to AWS, and now I'll choose Lambda. Keep it in Northern California, and we'll create a new function, author it from scratch, and I'll call this my test function 78. Just using the date, I'm going to keep it in Node.js 12, and I'm going to leave the permissions as just normal execution role, basic Lambda permissions, which allows it to execute itself. I'm going to add some permissions at the end of the video, and you're going to see why, obviously, to connect to S3. I'm going to keep that there for now. So go ahead and create that function. It's going to spin for a minute. Okay, good times. It created that function successfully. And of course, there's just this hello from Lambda message. So now I'm going to drop in my own Lambda code in Node. So I'm going to copy this and then I'm going to explain briefly what it does. And then we're going to test it. And then we can move on to the next video. So I'll provide this code to you. And of course, being a Linux system, you can't do a copy and paste. So Control V. And here's how it's going to work. I'm going to bring in the AWS SDK and within that specifically AWS S3 object, instantiate an object called S3, have a variable with our bucket name and our folder name. And I'm going to have the key name as date now. Now you can use the UUID library as well. All we're trying to do with that is have a unique name for each data object in our bucket. I like to use date.now for an epic timestamp because I get the benefit of having non-collision, just like the UUID library, but I also get a nice sequential timestamp. So I usually use date now instead of UUID, and I don't have to roll up, I don't have to do any NPM with rolling up any external libraries. Now I have two comments commented out here. I have event, which is my incoming data object, and I have more specifically when we go through API Gateway. I want to extract something nested deeper. I use event query string parameters. For this part of the lecture, I'm just going to use event. So I, that's good enough for right now. And everything else here is done filling the object and dispatching that via the S3 put object to our S3 bucket. So the only thing I have to do now is fill this in. And a real easy way to do this is come back here to S3. So first I can copy my bucket here, right here. I'm just going to copy that, come back to Lambda, stick that right where it says your bucket name. And you'll have your own obviously unique bucket name because you can't have mine. And then my folder name is just test folder. And those are the only two parts you have to copy and everything else is going to be done for you. So I'm going to go ahead and save that. And the next thing I have to do is test this to see if my JSON data object is going in my S3 bucket. But as I said earlier in the video, I can't test it because currently my Lambda does not have permission to send anything to S3. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to scroll up here, go to permissions, and I'm going to open my permission, which so far is just the Lambda basic execution role, allowing Lambda to execute itself. So I'm going to add a managed policy. 
So the way I do this is say attach policy, and I'm just gonna type in this box X3, and I'm lazy, so instead of using the least permissive possible, I'm gonna go ahead and give it all S3 access. Since I'm allowing it to write to S3, I'm not too worried about it deleting remotely. So if you wanna make it more professional, you can narrow down the permissions to just the S3 put, but I don't wanna waste the time doing that for this video for prototyping, so I'm just gonna give it S3 full access and attach this policy. All right, cool, that's already done, so I can just go ahead and shut this off. And I'm gonna go back here to the configuration tab, and now we're good to send whatever test payload we have from Lambda to that S3 bucket we just created as designated right here. So let's go ahead and configure our test event. So I'm gonna go ahead and configure test event, and I'll just put in a little bit of custom code here so you know this isn't fake, and how about that? All right, so we have a JSON object here. We just have to make sure it's proper JSON, and I messed that up, so I'll put that back. And I'm just gonna call this T1. That's a catchy name. Go ahead and create that, and then we're gonna test it and confirm that we didn't have any problem. So it tests, and it says our results were successful. We have a null result just because I haven't programmed any response, but it looks good. So the last thing we have to do in this video before moving on to API Gateway is come back to our S3 bucket and refresh to make sure indeed we have a data object in here. Now we'll click this data object, but you'll see if I click this right here, it's gonna say access denied. And the reason it's saying that is because this is a private bucket. So I'm gonna make it public later, but for now I'm gonna keep it private. So we can still overcome that. I simply have to download my data object. Again, remember this is in a file because you can't concatenate or append it. It's a data object for blob storage. So download it and now you can open this in any editor you like. If you're really cool, you're gonna be using VS Code. I'm pretty lame, so I'm gonna be using Notepad++. I'm showing my age, but I find VS Code to be kind of bloatware for most of what you would need to do. All right, you can see it successfully sent my custom test event. This is exactly what I sent. So you need to be at this point before you move on to video two to make sure everything's working to this point, because if this isn't working, nothing else going forward is gonna work. And that's true for each of these videos. So let's move on to the next video where we set up API Gateway and set up an API Gateway security key in the next video.